Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. The topic on the table today is that of social anxiety disorder. Now at first glance it's going to sound like simple shyness, but there's so much more to this. It's really about how we all function and sometimes can't function in everyday settings. And we have with us a true expert today, Dr. Murray Steen, professor of psychiatry here at the University of California, San Diego. Welcome. Thanks. Now, when I was getting ready for the show, I came across a quote that you have in one of the articles that you wrote from Mark Twain, and I just loved it. Man is the only animal that blushes or needs to. Right. And, and I thought that was great because we think about what our actions are like, and we, we, we worry about what other people think about it. I open the show by saying it sounds like shyness when you talk about social anxiety disorder, but there's so much more to it. Can you define social anxiety disorder? And as we go along, we'll talk about why that's different than somebody who just is a little nervous. Sure. Um, the other term that people use in addition to social anxiety disorder, sometimes they'll call it social phobia. So people will see both terms being used. And you're right. It's, um, it has an element of shyness at its core. So the, the concern that people with social anxiety disorder have is that when they're in situations where they're around other people, and there's the potential for other people to think badly of them, that that's going to happen. So they're afraid that uh, if they're eating in a restaurant, they're going to spill something on themselves. Other people are going to notice their handshake. They're going to think badly of them. And as a result, they actually start avoiding those sorts of situations. Um, and what's different than shyness, even though it has that element of shyness to it, is really how severe it is. Um, for us to say somebody has social anxiety disorder, these kinds of fears about being scrutinized by other people um, are at a point where um, it interferes with their life, where they don't go out, can't do things, can't meet people, um, can't progress in school because they reach a point where they have to present in front of groups and find out they can't do it, and they actually divert and do something else. Um, so once it's at the point where that severe shyness interferes with things that people do or things they want to do in the future, then we say it's social anxiety disorder. Uh, there, there are going to be people who are listening to what you said and say, I get nervous before I go out when the waiter comes over and asks me what wine to order and I realize I don't know anything about wine and I'm on the spot. I get a little nervous or my peers going to judge me badly. What do I do? Suck it up. What's different about these people that it's not just that same moment that all of us have faced at, at one point in our lives or even face a little bit all the time? I mean, that's one of the things about social anxiety disorder. I think on, on the bright side, it sort of helps people understand it because we've all had experiences like that. Um, but it also can lead people to sort of say, oh, you know, I've had that, no big deal. It's really a matter of severity and, and pervasiveness. Um, people who have social anxiety disorder, it'll be just about any situation where there's the opportunity for them to be self-conscious, they are. Um, and the kinds of feelings they have, the anxiety can be so overwhelming that they literally just can't do it at all. And so they learn that the best way for them to get by is often just to avoid completely. Um, but it is a matter of, of severity, and uh, that's one of the reasons I think it makes this particular disorder kind of hard to understand, because people see some of themselves in it. Some people probably see themselves in that description because they really do have social anxiety disorder. Now, the other thing I was struck by in preparing for the show is the, the sort of catch-22 of this being a little bit like what we've all touched, leading to not getting diagnosed. And, and, and folks probably, uh, there have been people who got berated or yelled at who have a problem and just felt like there was something wrong with them or that there was no help or just got sort of that negative spiral that was going on. And I would also think that someone who is worried about those types of situations is be less likely to, to seek care, to pick up the phone, to make the appointment, to go to the doctor, to talk about these issues. Yeah, well, a couple of things have been going on. I mean, we know for a fact that uh, most people with social anxiety disorder never seek help for that problem. So why is that? Well, in, in part, it's because um, often they've had it for so long. Uh, most people with social anxiety disorder have had it ever since childhood. They just see it as part of them. It's just, this is just me. You know, why would I go to a doctor to try and get help with this if this is just me? And of course, on the flip side, for those people who have been brave enough, and they go to their physician and they say, you know, 
I, I really find I'm really uncomfortable around other people and it's stopping me from doing things. Up till now, what most doctors would say is, oh yeah, we, we all get a little bit like that, don't worry about it, it's nothing. So even if they've um, been courageous enough to seek help, there hasn't been a lot of awareness in, in the medical community that you know this actually is a problem for some people and it's something that we can treat. I remember in medical school 20 years ago, I was uh, uh, came across during my psychiatry rotations, one of the psychiatrists said, well, there's Toastmasters that helps people get over those kinds of things and, and those other um, books that have been written to help people to you know, teach them look me in the eye and shake the hand and how to get up and perform. Mm -hmm. We're past that, what we're talking about right now, or do those still have a role? They do have a role. I mean, a lot of people um, will have sort of a milder form of social anxiety disorder where it really can be just limited to sort of the public speaking sorts of things. And in those cases, um, Toastmasters where people learn skills and they get to practice them are actually very good. And most of the people, you know, that we see um, in our clinic and the people who are participating in our research, it's, yes, they may not be able to speak in public, but that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. They, it's just so much of a, a more pervasive problem for them that Toastmasters is, is not going to do the job. There was a phrase I came across, lost opportunity. And it, it, it touched me. It made me sad almost thinking about that, that there are folks who just step away from opportunities because they don't even want to be in that situation. Yeah, I mean, the great example is somebody who has, say, the, you know, the academic talent to be able to go to college, and they realize that because college is going to involve having to meet a whole bunch of new people, um, getting out of maybe the, the little niche of familiarity where they can function, um, and then having to, you know, speak in class, that they're going to be graded on that, they decide I'm not going to go to college. And, you know, we've treated people who, after they get treatment, now maybe they're in their 40s or their 50s, they get treated, and there's this real sadness sort of saying, I really wish I'd done this earlier on because my life would be different. And we've actually even had people go back to college, you know, when they're 40 or 50. It's not the same for them. There really is a sure. lost opportunity. Um, but that's one of the reasons we're trying to sort of get the word out about this problem so people know about it and seek treatment earlier. Um, I have to just give you a compliment. You're a very good writer, and I've read a lot of the things that you've written, and you've written a lot about all this. Um, at, at one point, um, is the Unabomber someone who you would say, you know, a, a recluse type person with social anxiety disorder? And will you point out that these are people who want, actually want to be able to do it? They, they, they don't want to be alone. They want to have social interaction. They crave it, but they don't know how to do it. There's a big difference between that and the, the true social misfit or, you know, if you will. Right. I mean, there, there is definitely a group of people who hate other people. Um, you know, they, they want to hurt other people and, and they're recluses, you know, by choice because of that. Uh, but people with social phobia, they can be seen as being recluses. Um, often the other way they're viewed by their peers is sometimes people will think they're snobs because, you know, here's somebody who um, doesn't sit with anybody else in the lunchroom at work, doesn't seem to have very much to say. Very often people will say, oh, the person's just stuck up. The truth may be that they're absolutely terrified to engage with other people in any way. So there are a lot of misconceptions about this problem. Um, the continuing to talk about this disorder, because I want to get to what we do about it yeah. in a little bit. I grew up in a family of loud New York Jews. <laughs> that was what we, we all talked, and everybody talked with their hands and, and, and did all that. Um, culturally, we were sort of outgoing type of people, but as I told you before the show started, I would practice before all those situations to make sure I was ready for it. Now, there are some cultures where people are generally more reserved and reticent to speak up. Do, do, does, does social uh, anxiety run in families? Is there a cultural component to this? And, and, and where you're raised and what part of the world you're raised and, and those cultural things make a big difference? Yeah, so let me touch on the, the cultural part of it first. Um, we know that even in cultures where people are much more reserved, say if you look at Japan, there's all sorts of rules about when you speak up and what you say and, and when you say it. Even there, the Japanese psychiatrists say, oh, we see social phobia. Uh, and it turns out to be in about the same rate as it would be in America. Um, so even within these differences in, in cultural variations, there's still some people where um, it's even in situations where they should be able to be open and, and, and they can't do that. Now in terms of... You said the same rate as America. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. 
How, what percent? Sure. So, you know, the rates vary a little bit depending on which study you look at, but probably the most conservative, the lowest rate is about 5% of people um, in the U.S. have social anxiety disorder. And, and that means that they have it um, at a level where it really is interfering with, with their lives in That's a substantial in way. It's one in 20. So if you look at the average classroom, there's one kid sitting in that classroom that's going to have this problem. Yeah. In fact, I say to people um, when they try and sort of understand what this is, I say, think of uh, your high school graduating class and think of the person who was the most shy person you knew. Um, the person you knew couldn't speak up in class, maybe had a couple of close friends, that was probably somebody with social anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. now, in terms of um, sort of the familial nature of this, and it really does run in families, so it's very clear. Um, it's uh, also clear from twin studies that it has a strong genetic uh, makeup to it. Um, and uh, particularly in families where you'll see a parent with with social anxiety disorder, very often they'll have one or more children uh, with the problem. Well, I mean, it strikes me. If you have social anxiety disorder, how do you go date? I mean, how do you even get to the point where you're married and have a child if the, because uh, the dating situation has to be somewhat nerve-wracking. It, it is for anybody to go up to a pretty girl and, and talk to them and, or a girl to go up to a guy and, and in, a, in a school situation or a, a social situation, a bar. You have to be there to meet someone. Yeah. How, do they, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, that can be a, a huge problem for, um, for people with social anxiety disorder when they're in high school and college. Um, often, you know, they, they won't have a big social circle and they may actually not date much. I mean, we've seen people who literally married the first person they ever went out with. Uh, because they said, wow, here's somebody who actually asked me out. This is never going to happen again. Um, and, you know, sometimes things work out great, sometimes they don't. We've also seen people in, you know, pretty unhappy marriages who are then afraid to leave them because, you know, if I leave, now, how, now what? That's, that's a little spooky. Yeah. The other part about the dating scene, and you mentioned sort of going to, uh, to a bar or whatever, the way some people with social anxiety disorder have managed to somewhat cope with the problem is they drink. And they find that, you know, alcohol is a, a social lubricant. It does reduce social anxiety to some extent. And that's the way some people have, have coped and also the way that some people get into some serious problems with alcohol abuse. Has the internet changed this? Is it a safer place or a stranger place to sit and, you know, in, in the comfort of your own home and type on a computer? Well, I think what it's done is it's made it paradoxically a little easier for people who are uncomfortable actually going out and meeting people to sit at home and stay on the internet. Um, so I think there's been somewhat less of an impetus now for people with, some people with social anxiety disorder to kind of go out and meet people because it's more socially acceptable to just sit and talk on the internet and never really actually have any any face-to-face -face contact. When, when you do some of your work, and you, I know you're starting to look at the brain of folks who are in this situation, what are you, are you seeing? Are you seeing different patterns or is there something that's truly different in the way they're processing information in their brain? Well, we know that, uh, so social anxiety disorders, uh, one of the anxiety disorders, there are many others, are panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. One I've heard recently is performance, dis uh, performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. Is that in the same? Yeah, so performance anxiety gets categorized sort of within social anxiety disorder, but it's, it's a relatively small piece of it. And most people with performance anxiety um, you know, they wouldn't come to see me as a psychiatrist. They would either go to Toastmasters or they'd take classes. They might see, you know, sort of a coach to get over it. Um, but it is sort of a small piece of social anxiety disorder. In terms of what we see in the brain, um, we see in social anxiety disorder and some of the other anxiety disorders that some of the parts of the brain that are involved in emotion processing and emotion regulation, called the limbic system, and part of that uh, includes pieces of the limbic system like the amygdala and the insula, um, that these seem to be actually overactive in people with social anxiety disorder when they're processing emotional information. And it's kind of like this emotional part of the brain um, doesn't have the brakes put on it in the way that it should. So in dangerous situations, we really want our amygdala to get activated. It tells us something bad's going to happen. It lets us sort of think about doing something or escaping. But you don't want your brain doing that in a social situation where the danger is really only that other people, you know, might not like you. 
Um, and that seems to be one of the things that's going on and one of the areas of the brain that treatment is influenced by. So it's not a choice. I mean, you're hardwired this way. You're certainly hardwired. I mean, we're all hardwired to um, be able uh, to interact with other people, and it's uh, a good thing that we're hardwired to be sensitive to what other people think. Otherwise, we just, you know, all go out and it'd be every man for himself. Sometimes um, it feels that way. <laughs> sometimes it feels that way. Um, but, you know, we have um, uh, this structure of the brain that helps us understand that it's important that we work together, it's important that we affiliate. Uh, but in people with social anxiety disorder, it's like that part of the brain is just on, uh, turned on all the time uh, and at a much higher gain than it should be. Now these, um, the spectrum of social anxiety disorder, uh, from what I understand, the onset is usually in teenagehood, from 11 to 19, roughly? It, there's sort of two groups. There's about half of the people who weren't particularly shy as kids. Uh, sometime in adolescence, and adolescence is a time where sort of everybody becomes more self-conscious and more self-aware and you think more about what other people think about you. Some people with social phobia, that's where it turns on. But there's about half, and these are actually the people who have the most severe social anxiety disorder later in life, they have always been that way. I mean, you ask them, you know, what stories do your parents tell you about yourself when you were a kid? It's like, oh, well, you know, as soon as people would come into the house, you'd run upstairs and hide. Uh, we couldn't get you to ever order in a restaurant, you know, we sort of had to bribe you to do that. And it just continues for them and becomes pretty severe social anxiety disorder in adulthood. Do parents have trouble with their kids that way? I mean, if you're not one of those people who also had this sort of problem in a household, it's got to create an issue with a, a a mom or dad. It, it, it can even if uh, the parent themselves went through it. Um, sometimes what we'll see is a parent who had social phobia and they remember how tough it was for them as kids, so they try and protect their child from it. And so they don't get their kid to order in the restaurant and they talk to the teachers and say, you know, my, my son has trouble speaking up in class, can he just sort of get out of doing performances? And that's not a good thing because one of the important ways to overcome this is for people to really um, in sort of a very nurturing setting, get pushed, if they can't push themselves, to do things so that they eventually become comfortable with them. That's sort of part of what we do also in, in uh, behavior therapy. And that's, that's exactly what I wanted to get to next, which is, yeah. which is what to do. Behavioral therapy. Let's start there because you just mentioned it. We're finally getting around to, we, I, I hope, and I really wanted to spend a good chunk of this talking, convincing people that this is real, because uh, I have a feeling that's the fear. Now let's tell them not only is it real, but there's something we can do, behavioral therapy. Yeah, what so is it? The, you'll hear the terms um, behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And basically this is a type of uh, psychological treatment where people learn about the problem, um, they get an explanation of you know, why it is they feel that way when they're in social situations, and they really learn the link between kind of how they feel and the way they think about social situations and how that then influences their behavior. And so the big thing in social anxiety disorder is when you feel uncomfortable, when you have these thoughts that uh, people are going to think I'm stupid if I speak up, you don't say anything. And if you haven't done that for 10 years, it becomes very difficult to overcome. And so uh, what a therapist will do in cognitive behavioral therapy is help people to kind of understand this pattern and then work with them to gradually overcome it, to say, okay, I know you, you have these thoughts when you're in these kinds of situations. How realistic are the thoughts? Um, let's test it out. Let's ask some people whether when you say something, the first thing they think is, oh, what an idiot. Um, and maybe those thoughts aren't that realistic. And if they're not that realistic, then maybe you could start practicing testing out some of these things and kind of unlearn some of the bad habits you've had and um, kind of learn that these things are safe to do and actually can be enjoyable. That's the other part about social anxiety disorder. People, um, even though they crave the social interaction because they know that's what people need, it's been so hard for them to do that they've sometimes lost the enjoyment of doing it. And part of it is them learning that, hey, I can actually get pleasure out of talking to other people and, and getting to know them and then getting to know me. And that, that makes sense. What about the younger person who that kind of insight is very difficult for? Right. So with the younger kids, they don't know at all why they're not doing these things, right? They go to a birthday party and 
they can't talk to anybody. Um, and, and in fact, I didn't mention earlier, there's actually sort of a very early onset form of this disorder that's called selective mutism. It can be so bad that the kids literally won't speak or can't speak at all outside of speaking to their parents and their siblings. They'll go to school in kindergarten and won't say a word. I have seen kids in my office as a, someone who specializes in pediatric field who they won't look at me. They only look at their parents and they won't, they won't say a word in the office. Yeah. I mean, nothing, and I'm pretty good with kids. I, right. Nothing I do ever gets them to come out. They just won't even. So kids like that, they of course don't understand. It's just you know overwhelming for them. They don't know why they feel that way. And so there it's just more of the behavior therapy. It's more, okay, we're gonna gradually um, help the child feel comfortable speaking. They're gonna get positive feedback for it and work with them to overcome it. Now even in those situations, sometimes the behavior therapy alone doesn't work and, and we look at other treatments like other medical treatments. And, and so medical treatments start to imply medications. Yeah. And there's a host of medications. They're the old ones that I learned when I was in school that you know you take a beta blocker for stage fright, quote unquote. But that's not necessarily the right thing to do for social anxiety disorder. Yeah, so most of what people know if they hear about medications for social anxiety disorder, it's beta blockers. And uh, beta blockers have sort of a small role to play. Uh, oftentimes performers, musicians, will use beta blockers. Uh, they'll kind of reduce the racing heart. If somebody has a lot of shaking, it'll reduce that a little bit. But for people with this more pervasive form of social anxiety disorder, where even you know one-on-one -on -one they're uncomfortable, the beta blockers really don't work. So what we have now, and it's only been in the past 10, 15 years, prior to that we, we really didn't know how to treat social anxiety disorders. So when I was doing my um, training as a, as a resident in psychiatry, we had really no clue how to treat this at all. Um, now we have learned that some of the antidepressants uh, work to treat social anxiety disorder. And the interesting thing is a lot of people with social anxiety disorder do become depressed at some point in their lives, in part because they're so, um, they become socially impoverished, they're just alone. Many will become very seriously depressed. But we know that we can use medicines um, like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, medicines people might know include um, medicines like Prozac or Paxil, um, actually work remarkably well um, for these severe kinds of social anxiety disorder. So somebody sitting at home shouldn't feel like there's nothing that can be done. There's actually a whole lot that can be done. I mean, one of the, er one of the reasons I like to work in this field is because um, we're able to help people make such dramatic changes in their lives with either the cognitive behavioral therapy or medication treatments or both. Uh, it's actually really rewarding to see people change sometimes dramatically in very positive ways. If you could control the world, and <laughs> the world at large, and the medical world, what would you like to see happen in this field over the next generation? It would be nice just for there to be more awareness about the problem. Um, I think people are starting to understand not only that this is a, a very common problem, um, but for many people it, it's really very serious. Um, and because it affects people often so early in life, it it leads, to, it has a lot of repercussions in terms of um, sort of stopping people in their tracks, in terms of marrying, um, education, career. The lost opportunity. Lost opportunity, and uh, it, it wouldn't take a lot in terms of getting the word out about treatment. We've also got to sort of learn more about the actual etiology of the disorder, get better treatments. Um, but sort of be at a point where people could feel confident that they could go to a doctor and ask for help and that help's going to be available for them. And you and I are both professors in a medical school. How much of this is taught to medical students these days? I think now, um, you know, I mean I know I talk about the anxiety disorders to our medical students so they certainly hear about it and uh, so I think things are better than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Um, it, there's still, you know, more work to be done. For someone who's sitting at home, and I, I keep picturing somebody you know, watching the show, um, who do they go to first? They go to their internist? They go to a psychiatrist? They go to a psychologist? Where do they turn for resources to get more information about all this? Yeah, well, most people, just because of the way our healthcare system's set up, are going to go to their primary care physician. And, you know, they're best off if they go armed with some information because their primary care doc may or may not know something about this. There are very good uh, websites. There's an organization called the Anxiety Disorders Association of America 
that has great information about social phobia and other anxiety disorders. They can go to the National Institute of Mental Health website uh, and get really good information and then kind of go to their primary care doc and say, you know, I think I might have this. Is, can we talk about this? And, or I think my child might have this. Or I think my child, yeah. How early should a parent be thinking, my four-year-old, my six-year-old, my eight-year-old, my 10-year-old might have this and go to the pediatrician in this case? Yeah, we don't have a good feel for, uh, some kids, even if they're really, really shy, will just sort of outgrow it with sort of natural experiences. We don't know which are the kids who really need something more intensive in the way of, of therapy. So my recommendation is, if you're concerned about your child being excessively shy, go talk to your pediatrician about it. Pediatricians are, um, you know, generally very good at either saying, let's wait and watch this, or, or let's do something sooner. Telling the difference between a developmentally appropriate and developmentally inappropriate milestone. Yeah, and sometimes it's just a matter of, you know what, I'm not concerned now, but I do want to keep an eye on it. Let's come back in six months and let's sort of see how things are going. And see where they're at. Well, I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming and chatting about this because sometimes putting something in the light of day is all the difference in the world. And for someone sitting at home who's not educated about this, to hear about this can be the difference between them getting care and not. So. I appreciate you having me here. Well, thank you. Thanks for being out there making noise about it. I hope everyone's been listening. There is a line between what we all feel and what then becomes problematic. When something begins to interfere with your function, with your ability to do the things that you would want to do in life, now it may be time to talk about getting help or to chat with your physician about this. In this day and age on the internet, we have great resources that you can read more about it. We say it all the time here on Health Matters. Knowledge is power. Get armed with the knowledge about what's going on with your own health, with your own attitudes, with your own approaches to life, and you can help yourself. I'm Dr. David Granite, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next time right here on Health Matters.